she is. What is this? It's a dial. I'm the first I'm one. Close. All 28. I'm close. I might um, trade dollars have, with you. Yeah, I have two Winovas. So I may, I may, sh- I may swap yeah. dollars with you after. For realsies. It's on. I texted Dawn. I was the first one to get all 28. She's like, I never doubted you for a second. <laughs> She's like, I know. I know you I enjoy know you it. Because you're really good. <laughs> I know. I stuck up mine for a minute. I did too. So beautiful. We might have to put like some money on my yeah, dad. Totally do that. I sent um, Nadine the link because of the thing last year. Then. Oh, and so to see if she wanted to watch it. Because I know she likes to be included. Yep. So I sent it to her. Uh, so you know. Is this for presenters only? No, uh-uh. you, can, you can sit. Okay, you can sit. Do I need to give you any? This is going fantastically. I see you got a huge sack. Yeah, look at her. She does. I think she was first last year. No, I might have beat you last year. I might have. You were very close behind me. Don't worry, I'll put it back. You can put it back. Well, it says you're presenting as me in the program. That would be interesting. It says that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you could just do it. Just run. And I'll, I'll read your slides and you read mine. Sure. That would be awesome. It would be fun. <laughs> It's it's yeah. a it's a new form of new form. It's like it's like style. lightning round <laughs> speed I like that. swap or I don't know. We should do that next year. Of like a grab bag of presentations. Just have six people who come in and Yeah, just whatever you grab out of a hat. It could be fun. How many times I lose my gotcha. keys? So I'm actually kind of excited about this. Amongst yourselves, mingle. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, I think we only have one wireless microphone. The you want to? Yeah. Over here, and then we have the catch box. I'll cover the catch box. Are you all were. Are you all familiar with catch box? Basically, it's a microphone. You throw it at people's heads. Uh, it is off until it arrives to you. At which point, you simply talk into it, and the gentleman in the back will handle the on and offing of it. Is that correct? Slide up, slide down. Very good. Uh, all right, we can find one. So we're going to move ahead with that, or really that's for two extra minutes. That's okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Raul. At this point, everybody knows who I am. Uh, and this is the lightning rounds. This is an opportunity to do a uh, quick rapid fire. I call them rapid fire at first, and that sounds kind of aggressive. Uh, so we're calling them lightning rounds. Uh, five to 10 minute presentations back to back to back to back. Uh, and I actually, I'm just gonna throw it out to Kerry Kaiser, Kieser, Kaiser from Lewis Clark State College, which I learned some time ago is not the same as Lewis and Clark. No, I, this is Lewis hyphen Clark. Which is in Montana? No, we're in Idaho. Oh, I'll get that right sometime. You will, yes. you will. We'll cover it real briefly and here as we get your... going. Yep, okay. perfect. All right, so as Raul mentioned, I am Carrie Kaiser. I'm an instructional designer at Lewis Clark State College. We're located in Lewiston, Idaho, which is on the border of Washington and Idaho. And we are, as he mentioned, Lewis hyphen Clark, not Lewis and Clark. We probably have some colleagues from there. Um, as well, but we are two separate locations. So what we're gonna be looking at today is how to get math and science tutoring to students that are off campus. So um, at LCSE, we're uh, a smaller state college. We have about 4,000 full-time enrollment students. Um, and on campus, we have um, a tu- math and science tutoring center. Um, it is coordinated by Suzanne Rousseau. She's one of our math faculty, and she has um, about 20 tutors, and the tutors are students. Um, and the 
um, Math and Science Tutoring Center has been fairly successful on campus. And why it works is it's an easy access for students. So it's, a, it's located in the Math and Science building, so it's where the students are. They see it, they feel comfortable walking in there. Um, and it's open, uh, it's got fairly good open hours. It's open Monday through Friday and then again on Sundays. And it's um, open up until um, 7 p.m. regularly. And then um, during final, right before finals and midterms and stuff, they have extended hours as well. The room itself is really conducive. They've got a lot of tables with whiteboards that students can draw on. They've got computers. They've got all the different calculators that the students need. So it's all there for them. And the other reason it works, I think, is because the tutors are students. So the students aren't feeling like they're going to their faculty member and intimidated by it. It is a fellow student being their tutor. Um, and the other side of it is it's a free feature. So students are able to just walk in there and use it. But the problem was is how do we reach everyone? How do we get to the online students? How do we get to the students who commute? At LCSC, we have a large population of non-traditional students. Um, and we have a lot of students who aren't full time. So they may just be coming into Lewiston, commuting maybe two hours to come in. Um, and they're only coming in on for their Monday, Wednesday class. But on Tuesdays, they're doing their homework and they need help with their classes and tutoring. Um, and for students who also with that non-traditional population, we have a lot of people who work full time. So it might be eight, nine o'clock before they're able to sit down and do their homework and that's when they needed their tutoring. So how could we help them? And one of the things was, can online tutoring really work? So first thing we had to come up with was we have to be able to offer the same thing online. So we need to have the tutors be students so that it's comfortable. We need to have the whiteboard feature, like how the students come in and they just work on the tables. We need that there. We also need the ease of access. We need it to not be intimidating. We need a, students to be able to feel welcoming and come in and do the online tutoring. Um, and also to keep the service free. You can't have it at a cost to our students or it's not going to get used. And it's not fair to the students. So who's willing to try this? So you gotta, you gotta love some guinea pigs. So this idea came up last semester. Um, Suzanne Rousseau, the coordinator, um, kind of came to me and was like, is this possible? You know, she, she honestly is not a technology person. She wasn't, she didn't know. Um, and so we found a few of her about 20 tutors. We had about, I think five the first semester who were willing to be our online guinea pigs to help us work through this process um, and figure out what we needed to do. We also had great support from the division chair for the, um, natural sciences and mathematics at our college, as well as higher up the chain. And then we also had buy-in from my office, e-learning services. And so those were our, our guinea pigs to see if this would be able to work. The next thing we did was kind of brainstorm and make, make sure that we're able to meet those needs that we talked about. So we looked at the ways we had to connect online already on campus because we needed it to be free. Granted, we do pay for these features, but it wasn't at any additional cost to the tutoring center. So we have Blackboard Collaborate Ultra on our campus, and so that license was free because it's already paid for. Um, it has the whiteboard feature, it's integrated in the LMS, it launches directly in the browser, which means the technology, you don't have to download something to get it to work. Students are able to use it. It also has the call-in audio feature, so if students don't have great audio connection or having problems, they can use their phone to call in and use it. The other piece was how are these people going to be able to schedule? We weren't going to be able to have tutors sitting there all the time waiting for students to come in online, so we needed them to be able to schedule. Um, we needed another free service. Um, in our office at eLearning Services, the instructional designers there, we use the You Can Book Me calendars online that are free for faculty to be able to schedule and come in and meet with us. So I just turned around and used this for the tutors to be able to put their personal schedules up and then be able to have students come in and schedule with them through there. So that's another free service. Um, would we need to purchase anything? As I mentioned, the Collaborate was free, no additional cost. Um, you can book me as a free service. We did go ahead and purchase two or five different um, headsets just so that there was better audio and um, to listen and speak into headsets. Um, and we also purchased a few graphic tablets, the Wacom, and actually they don't have that, so the specific one we got, but they do have some of them demoed out here, one of the vendors do. Um, so we did those because we wanted the students, have you guys ever tried to work a math problem out using your mouse and trying to draw on stuff? It doesn't work. So um, we tried out a few different tablets and um, the math department was able to get a really good deal on about five of those. And then, will students need to purchase anything else? Because they're, if they have to purchase something to be able to use this, they're probably not going to. But all of our online students already have computers. Um, and to be honest, most students do have a computer, whether it's at their home or a laptop. 
Um, and that's really the basics of what they need to be able to do this tutoring service. They, if you have a webcam, yeah, you can connect visually, but it's not required. And yeah, you could have a microphone, but it's not required because you could call in on your phone. So there really wasn't anything additional for the students. So then how did it go? Well, we started last semester um, and we, I think Suzanne approached me in about September and we worked through this, got them on board, got everything lined up. And by the end of the semester, they'd done about 20 online tutoring sessions. It doesn't sound like very many, but with, we had basically zero advertising at the time. We were honestly just trying to figure it out. Um, coming spring semester, the interest, we didn't have quite as much. Um, Suzanne sent out a promo to the different um, teachers and stuff mid-semester, and I actually haven't gotten back with her to see how much that increased the usage and stuff. So that's, that's yet to be seen. Um, so what's next? Coming up next semester for the tutoring center, um, we will have, our campus may be moving from Blackboard Collaborate to using Zoom. So that's just, it's, it's not going to add any cost or anything, but it's, you know, technology that we're going to have to train on and do differently. Um, there's more promotions planned for next semester because it, students aren't going to use it if they don't know it's there. And the other thing is to recruit more online tutors, have more of her tutors that are in the tutoring center be willing to do this tutoring. And the tutors are able to do this from their homes. So um, it's not like they have to be at the center when they're doing the online tutoring. They can choose to do it at, if they want on their calendar. It is literally at their choice. If they want to be open to tutoring at midnight, they can. So. Um, and just a few takeaways from it is make sure you're using the resources you have. Um, research free options. There's a lot of great free tools out there to use. Um, communicate and build trust with your faculty. Suzanne probably, had I not worked with her on building two classes before that, she may have not reached out to me to work on this project with her. And so that's a really important thing to know. And just always remember, if the students don't know it's there, they're not going to be able to use it. So that's it. Any questions as we can get the next person? I have about three minutes for questions. If there's any, let me know. Or we can get the next person up and going for the next lightning round. Great. Thank you, guys. Is it this one? Yeah. Hey, you're getting tripped. All right, up next is uh, Chad Schoen. Shown from uh, OHSU, which I always call OHSU because I have, uh, sorry, Central Washington. OHSU is next. Central Washington uh, speaking on making their own space, developing a maker space where students are empowered to teach themselves. Actually, I need to talk to you about that later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I said, I'm Chad Schoen, Director of Multimodal Education Center, which is a technology center on uh, Central Washington. I've been there about two and a half years as the director, uh, started as the media technician for it. Um, now I have my own media technician, Forrest, and he really helped me with his presentation and um, helping us design and figure out how to use this space better. Um, the Multimodal Education Center embraces the vision that uh, technology empowers learning, and that's really kind of my mandate, is to figure out, get an innovative, innovative technologies in the hands of students, staff, and faculty, and encourage them in creative and innovative uses of technology. Um, and that's mainly our biggest thing. Um, it started out just as a center that people could just rent equipment, uh, and that's pretty much what we had space for. Uh, uh, just a place students could go to get a laptop, for example. And um, when I came in as director, I had a bigger vision of it, and I thought we could do a lot more with the space and with the talent that we had there. So we do still check out equipment. Um, laptops are our biggest item. We almost never have any, um, and we are up to 50, and I'm probably going to get 100 and see how that flies on campus. But it's always surprising to me how many laptops um, students want. The other biggest uh, item that we have are DSLRs. And I, when we started getting them, I never thought, Anyway, that's kind of beside the point. That DSLRs would be a hot ticket item, but students really love those high power cameras for some reason. Um, we also house two uh, different uh, computer labs, Mac and PCs. We have 3D printers, uh, laser cutter. Um, we, are, we started a virtual reality initiative last, uh, at the beginning of this uh, year, um, 2017. Um, and so we have four of those plus a HoloLens, um, and we offer weekly faculty and uh, student and staff workshops. And really, in the past, these have been somewhat informal, um, just one-offs. And we also, in addition to those informal ones, I offer uh, directed workshops for faculty if they want to learn how to use equipment and get it into their pedagogy and curriculum. 
Um, this is our space. Uh, we were lucky enough to get really some cool active learning um, furniture and things like that in the space. Um, you can see our virtual reality booths in the background. Um, set it up. Uh, we've got all our surfaces and you can write on them, which apparently students love that. They love the whiteboard stuff on your table. Um, it makes keeping it clean a little interesting uh, 3d printing and then that's just uh, an example of one of our video booths um, that not only does virtual reality but it's a high-tech uh, computer that can handle pretty heavy graphics and things like that if they want to do digital audio or video editing um, animation that kind of stuff um, previously when I uh, before I even started we didn't have any workshops and I was as a media tech I'm like we should be offering something um, just kind of see what people are interested in. So I started offering some workshops that were offered maybe once a week, a uh, podcasting workshop here, a Photoshop workshop there. Um, they were all introductory. I created a script. We went from that script on. It was once a size fits all. Um, and we would get some interest from students. We would get maybe a smattering of students come in for each workshop, but we'd never see them again. And we have no idea what how effective it was as a extracurricular workshop for them, whether they ever used the, the tools that we went there. The biggest focus for me was 3D printing because I want to, I think it's really cool product uh, 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 technology. And I really thought students are, generally they'll just find something on Thingiverse, say I want to print this. I want them to be able to create and make things. So how do we get them to start in something like Tinkercad and actually build the schools, uh, skills that they want to actually build something that is useful for them. Um, so we had this idea, we were thinking, and good pedagogical pra practices. Um, we have an awesome opportunity to create a learning-centered, active learning space. And so uh, just based on some of adaptive learning um, approaches, um, student learning centers are innovative and varied, but usually they have uh, discovery exercises, a place for exchange of ideas, simulation, and it's problem-based learning. So like they want students to come with something that they want to solve and then help them, guide them towards solving those things, project-based. And what we're trying to do is allow students who come to these workshops actually develop their own projects and come to us with their problems and say, we're gonna lead you through those to develop something cooler than just finding, uh, just making a keychain, for example. Um, so project-based learning kind of follows these steps. Um, we don't have a specific academic, I don't, I'm not struck by academic, um, curriculum guidelines or anything like that because it's extracurricular. I like to follow it because I am in the uh, uh, instructional technology side, but um, I, do, I, I don't have to worry about that so much. What I do get to do is talk to the students and find out what kind of things they want to do and then lead them through the process of discovery and finding and providing the expertise to guide them but not necessarily lead them. And um, all of that, we st and eventually I'd like to, this is kind of, our, I guess we're in our third term now of trying this, um, to get them to start presenting. We have a, an annual thing called Source, which is a, an opportunity for students to present their research and creative exercises. So next year, hopefully, we'll have some Source product, projects that they can um, present. So our workshop schedule uh, kind of came down to this. Um, what I found is what I wanted something that's consistent that students can just drop in in. And instead of having just a one-off and never seeing them again, that they have an opportunity to come in and get um, help every time and lead themselves through different software products or uh, hardware projects that we can assist them on. So um, this is what we come up with. I'll probably do some fiddling with that. We also offer one-offs still, like a podcasting one, something to supplement to see what kind of things students are still interested in. Um, but the biggest one that we do is that Photoshop students uh, I, I don't find it heartening that they want to know about it. I find it it's, uh, a place of digital literacy that we can help with um, our faculty um, and students. Uh, and 3D modeling is also a pretty hot topic right now for them. Um, workshops take place daily from two to three at the center. Um, and what we try to do is do a half hour introductory, assuming that some students are coming in without any knowledge. So that first half hour is just introductory, trying to get them through a lesson or a, a making something. Um, in 3D printing, we always start with Tinkercad. And I, I always try to do something free so students can do this on their own. So I'm not looking for a product that, or a software platform where they don't have access to unless they come to my center. I want them to be able to go where they, wherever they want to learn and be able to do it on their own. 
Um, and then the next half hour is uh, self-exploration guidance. So we give them a project or we give them a problem, make a keychain, we give them the basics of how to do that with Tinkercad, and then we say, develop it and, and come to a solution. If we, get an if we get students that have never been there before, that's a great intro to them. And the students that have been there before, the next half hour can be de dedicated to my staff going around and helping them learn different skills, finding tutorials, or uh, exploring uh, more advanced topics with them. Um, student employees, I have about seven to eight of them. Um, and what I wanted them to do is feel empowered to teach um, they didn't sign on initially for this. They signed on to check out laptops. So, it, um, But I also uh, wanted them to go through whatever they wanted to go. They each get to decide which topic they feel more comfortable with or they want to learn. I have a video and film major. She wanted to be able to do video editing, and she already knew a lot of it. But throughout the process of being an expert and teaching, you learn. And that's how I, you know, that's how I, I, that's how I got through tech, right? Like, I, I wanted to learn. So I taught myself. So um, teaching others makes me a better uh, expert at it. And, um, and they decide what projects they want to work on. And they are empowered to come to me with any ideas that they have. And we talk about it. And we kind of develop a, a, some kind of curriculum around that. Um, attendees learn the basics. And then they are free to drop in at any time, for the most part. But they know at that time, from two to three, they're going to find an expert in that area. Um, doo -doo -doo. So student employees learn techniques they want. They get some guidance from me. Um, but I really want them to uh, come up and figure things out on their own and struggle with it a little bit. Not totally um, where they're at sea, but I can guide them on some of those things. I have to be an expert in all these things, too. But um, I do want them to be active learners as well. Um, and then that goes to professional development for them because they can go. I already know I got a few people that got hired out of once they graduated um, from me that that skill of noting Photoshop was something that caught the eye of their employer. Um, and the student employees apply those techniques to attend these projects. And, and it, because they're right close to being a learner themselves, they have a little bit of a different bond than I do with the students that come in and need help. Um, and they give them uh, initial projects, but I like to give them multiple choices so they just don't make a keychain. That's not the only thing you're going to make, or you can make in the intro. You have some three different designs to go from, and that's your goal at the end of it, um, however you get there. Um, and then afterwards, if the students are uh, attendees are interested uh, and want to be invested in learning more, then they can develop a project with our uh, student employees. Um, what I found is that weekly workshops allowed attendees to return and keep working on a project where they couldn't do that before. And uh, they can bounce each ideas. This is the coolest thing that I got, is that they bounce ideas off each other. And then once uh, someone's come a few times, they become somewhat of an expert that can teach a new introductory student. So there's this uh, collateral learning that keeps going on. Um, and they can go from basics to intermediate um, users to pros. So for example, we start students on Tinkercad, and then they learn Fusion 360 if they're so interested, and they want to do more advanced techniques with 3D modeling. And then from there, if they're really intent on learning something about it, they'll use Blender, which it, I don't know if anyone knows anything about. It's a very intense learning curve to learn Blender or Mudbox or something like that. But that allows them to sculpt and actually do some really cool things in 3D. On a, a different scale, they go from iMovie, just basic editing, to Premiere, um, to After Effects. And that's what my student employee in film, she got to get really good at After Effects. So she didn't have any idea how to do those kind of cool things before. So some results. Um, I increased quarterly attendance by about 15%. Um, this is mostly due to 3D modeling and Photoshop. But it also is mostly due to students re, uh, coming back every, every week and following through on a project. So I get maybe a smattering of five people, and then two of those people keep coming back over and over again. Helps with my attendance. And it allows them to uh, work on multiple re iterations of design work and um, with expert mentorship. Some patrons actually became teachers, and they allowed to, they actually become teachers of us because they discover problems that we didn't even think about. And then we have to figure out, how do we solve that issue of creating something that doesn't have an overhang there because it's not printing correctly? So it allows us, it gives us some new ideas and things that we never even considered before. It also gives 
both my student employees and students and faculty and staff that come in some investment in my space and also some pride in learning. And they show it off. They bring their friends to come hang out at the MEC. And that's the greatest thing for me right now. Uh, any questions? Sure. <laughs> Now for real, here's, Car <laughs> here's Carrie Bailey from uh, OHSU, which is easier to say than Oregon Health and Sciences University. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, so Oregon. Well, this is kind of a stand-in for my official presentation. So um, I have a more detailed Full screen, right? Yeah, sorry. There we go. Okay. Yeah. So my presentation is on seeing it new, learning management systems for beginners' minds, and I am Carrie Bailey, and I am from OHSU, and I have more detailed um, data on what I'm going to talk about. But you know, the presentation is really the top. But if you want to look at the more um, finite information, um, there's a QR code and a Bitly link for a poster. But um, I'm going to kind of go back to paper, which is kind of anti-ed tech, but I am an English instructor by trade, so um, I'm coming out <laughs> as my first ed tech conference, and so my background is in using LMS systems to teach courses. And one of the things that happened to me last year on my adventure is I started at OHSU, and one of the first things I knew I would have to do at OHSU is I would have to... Yeah. <laughs> One of the first things I knew I would have to do at OHSU is learn a new LMS, which was Sakai. And I don't know if you visited any of these places, but I have been to this place, Blackboard, as an LMS. And I have been to Brightspace for D2L, another LMS. And I have been to this place, Canvas. So I use a lot of LMS systems, but Sakai was new to me. And one of the things I was wondering when I started at OHSU is, well, is this going to be more challenging? Is it going to be hard to completely relearn LMS from an instructional design perspective? And at that time, I was kind of just curious about navigation and other factors. And so what I did, in addition to just trying to initiate myself into using Sakai, I set up a usability test. Um, and what I did was I took screenshots of eight different courses on their homepage. So it's like you enter a course, and I asked the users to, where would you start? So it was a click test. Where do you begin this course? And they were from eight different systems. So I dug up 120 different gingerbread boys <laughs> who were participants, um, and they were just randomly selected. And the first question was, how familiar are you with any of the LMS systems I use? So um, I used the four that I just showed, and the statistics, and it's kind of shown in the poster, the market share, was really comparable to how many are actually using these systems. So it's kind of a fair um, representation of all users in the sense that not all of them were using one or was familiar with one. So it's kind of a fair representation of the market of the main LMSs. The one you don't see here is Moodle. Um, Moodle, as far as use, um, yeah, if anybody uses Moodle, I'd like to get a screenshot <laughs> of Moodle course so I could kind of throw it in the test, but um, Moodle's kind of in between Canvas and Blackboard with the number of users, so that, um, that's not represented. So the results of the test, they had eight different courses, they were asked to start the test, and they were timed on their success rate in the first click, could you start the course with one click? Um, and how long it took them to complete that. So the results were pretty broad. Um, the highest success rate in all of the examples was 91%, which is pretty high, um, and the lowest was 36%. The time it took for the users to click to start the course was anywhere between 10 seconds to 33 seconds, which if you really kind of look at a clock, that's quite a bit of time difference. Um, 
And so the thing that kind of emerged was that n not one LMS had the dominant um, design. It was across the board in the results. And the results are on the poster from that website. But this is kind of a graphic of when you put the time it took for them to complete the task and the success rate together. And what was interesting to me, I mean, there are a few little things I noted, but the first thing I noticed was that um, a course from Excelsior College and Southern New Hampshire University, and I had two of those, that was an A-B test for different audiences, um, those were the fastest clicks. And I think part of that is because they were designed for online students, where the other ones were a little more mixed. They may have had instructors who taught online, um, or weren't fully an online institution. So the ones that clicked fast were interesting to me. And then there were these. One of these is actually a course I taught for Linfield College, and it was one of the worst. So <laughs> clearly I need to work on my course design skills. But it was a Blackboard course, and it had a fairly low um, success rate. I guess I put a lot on that front page. Um, but this is kind of a range that was really interesting to me, and I'll talk about that in a second, where the Navigators took quite a bit of time, but they were also quite successful in getting through that. And here I'm going to explain why. So this is, this is the course that got the 91%. It's, the, it's an Excelsior course for business writing. And of all the um, course pages I had, this had the highest reading level. So totally like an English major, right? Like overwrite <laughs> the introduction. But the reading level was beyond college level. Um, I just kind of tested in terms of vocabulary and readability. So it had a very high reading level in terms of the words used, but it took users only 10 seconds to click that big green button. So, and I kind of tested myself. I couldn't read that in 10 seconds. So what I'm seeing with this um, particular website or course site is that they clicked and they didn't read. And so, and you can see why. There's a big green button that says start here. <laughs> and that forms what Don Norman in Design of Everyday Things back in 88 calls an affordance queue, where the big green button serves as a doorknob where it's like, you know, just go towards, go towards the light. <laughs> you know, um, act not do. And I think we all see that with students where clicking is, you know, it's fairly easy to do because you can correct it and go back if you get it wrong. And so this design feature seems to make a big difference in terms of the amount of time people spent on the page and also the ability to find where to go on that page. So that was an interesting result. Um, if you look at the spectrum of the eight courses I looked at, there was kind of this range of where it was too easy to know what to do and so it kind of encouraged clicking like with the green, big green button. Um, and then on the other side, like my poor Linfield College course, it was just a little too confusing. And so people would probably not get the click right. And then in this range, this kind of sparkly range, you had a pretty high success rate, and you had people who took time to actually interact with the content on the website. And one of the things I tested, this is another kind of idea I had, was um, how many of you are familiar with Quality Matters courses? Okay, so what's Quality, what's that? That's a set of standards for so I threw in two um, QM courses, one from OHSC, which is an epidemiology course, and the other a chemistry course, and, I, and they had been um, you know, certified QM, which means they had robust course design based on research. So they had been certified, and clearly a lot of work had been put into the design to pass their um, exam. And these scored pretty well in my little test, which kind of backs up the idea that good design is very important in terms of, you know, getting through an LMS in the way you want to. So this one from OHSU had a 67% success rate and they spent 22 seconds. Um, the Clark College course had a 70% success rate and they spent the longest amount of time reading it. Maybe they just liked chemistry, but um, 33 seconds. So they had some sense of reflection in processing the reading. So my takeaways with all of this, and I hope to do this again and maybe do some comparative work against not just all users, but maybe college students, um, is that course design had a greater effect than LMS. Not one LMS had you know, a preferred method or it was more successful than the others. Um, and that design visuals like that green button can compete with content, which is not where we want students to go. And one of the things that I read in the LMS literature is that one of the biggest pushes, and you can probably see it in some of the you know, developments in the tech here, is that 
stuff that we use in social media is impacting educational technology. And yeah, so um, I think we need to be aware of that and maybe how it affects reading. And then the final takeaway is usability is not learnability. So if you can use a site and navigate a site, it doesn't necessarily mean you're learning from that site. And I think it's important to distinguish those two. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we do have a couple of minutes for questions for you. Yes. What? Do you want the box? Um, so, um, at your university, how do you police and crack the whip when it comes to creating that kind of good, usable, and learnable course? It's an ongoing battle, and I have some colleagues here who can certainly speak to that too. Um, and fortunately at OHSU, we have certain schools pay kind of a premium to have their own course developers. So we do a lot of heavy-handed um, support. And I think stuff like QM, is very supportive because it gives a guide for them to follow. It's not very, it's not very sexy. Like QM is really kind of overwritten and I think it can be intimidating. But the fundamentals, and based on what I did, the fundamentals seem to support the fact that good design works. And I think that it's worth investigating what works in ed tech and what works in websites may not be the same thing. Yeah, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, faculty, it's hard. They're not always trained in design or technology, and I've been hearing a lot of conversations like that. Yeah. QM informally, and so how we sort of force their hand a little bit is we've built a template, and so whenever we train new faculty or do workshops, the courses we use always reflect that template, and so we kind of we sneak it in that way. And then when they see how well it works or they hear from people who have gone through our QM, co QM cohorts that we do every summer, they just kind of through word of mouth, it gets out there and more of them ask, start asking for it. So it's like a, just an exposure thing. Yeah. Works really well. Yeah, the trend of QM works really mm -hmm. well because it kind of becomes trendy. Yep. Yep. I hear you. No. Any other questions? Kathy, you want to speak to that? <laughs> no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, well, here's Anna Thompson. <laughs> uh, Anna, Anna's not with us uh, right now, so uh, I guess we're moving on straight to uh, Leif Nelson at Boise State, and you're going to be talking about why behavioralism won't die and why it, uh, and why it should. Yes, thank you, Raul. Thank you. As you can probably tell by the title, this is sort of a theoretical talk, so now's your chance to leave if you, if you want. Why behaviors behaviorism should die or you know some such title so let's go back about a hundred years uh, research and education was a relatively new field um, there was this epic battle taking place between on the one hand a philosophical approach to education research and on the other hand a scientific approach um, the only thing they could agree on was really bushy mustaches apparently <laughs> um, but before we get too deep into that let's go back another 50 years or so to like the mid 1800s uh, public education in the US was spreading like wildfire we had mandatory k-12 education in the 1850s we had the moral act of 1862 I think which um, issued land grants to spread public universities throughout the country um, and in fact it was so pervasive throughout the country that the rise in public education led to a teacher shortage and that required more women to enter the profession uh, and some of these women started doing scholarly research emphasizing the the nurturing and supportive aspects of education very feminine right so now let's go back to the 1800s industrialization was changing every aspect of our society new methods of scientific experiment and experimentation were being applied to all kinds of things including the management of people and organizations. You may have heard of like Taylorism and things like that, right? So folks like uh, Seymour Pressey and Edward, Edward Thorndike, these are psychologists in the early 1900s, they started creating these rudimentary machines that they used to study education from a scientific uh, standpoint. So these folks basically told the women, thanks, we'll take it from here, and kind of patted them on the head. And then men and their hard science or scientific methods uh, really overtook education research in the early 1900s, and they began kind of dominating that, that strain. 
Um, so these were the early behaviorists. They believed that people were like animals or even physical objects, and everything could be explained by natural laws of cause and effect. They also believed that observable things like memory recall were really all that mattered in education. Um, this is in contrast to Dewey, who we saw in the earlier slide. Um, he believed that education was more uh, democratic and should involve these shared social experiences and conversations between students and instructors and different generations and stuff like that. Philosophy versus science, right? Uh, also, around this time, uh, education policymakers in the United States talked about how concepts of punishment and reward, these new approaches to education, uh, and even propaganda could be used to indoctrinate youth and instill a sense of national pride through education. But as Dewey might counter-argue, uh, education should respect people's freedoms. Sharing different viewpoints against a backdrop of quote-unquote traditional knowledge should be a function of education. Punishment, reward, and memorization, that's how we train parrots, right? And people aren't parrots, are they? Well, for B.F. Skinner, fast forward a few decades, the 1950s-ish, uh, people were not like parrots, they were like pigeons. Actually, he used rats at first, but pigeons lived longer, so that was more convenient for him. Um, Skinner thought that early behaviorists got something fundamentally wrong. It wasn't just about automatic responses in individuals, like a dog salivating when we ring a bell, but really there were environmental factors, what Skinner called operant condition, Operant conditioning. Uh, if we can pinpoint just the relevant environmental factors, and Skinner thought that there really weren't very many, uh, we could understand all human experience through these scientific methods. Skinner, by the way, also believed that uh, human freedom was a myth and that thoughtful reflection was useless. He was an interesting guy. Uh, the problem with behaviorism, though, is that it actually works, at least on some level. So sure, people respond to stimuli. We eat when we're hungry. We feel sad or happy when things are intended to make us feel sad or happy. This stuff is obvious, right? The problem is that there are way, way, way too many variables at play in very complicated human experiences, like in education. And when data and design is used to manipulate and control superficial behaviors, that can be kind of objectifying. You might say that behaviorist tools and things like math learning or game theory can be useful or even fun. I agree, but these can be a slippery slope. Uh, design always contains bias. And to acknowledge that bias, the tools and systems should be totally transparent about what they are doing and how they work. Predictive systems are only as good as the things they measure. And if they measure things like memorization or promote these superficial behaviors like nudging or prodding, um, then maybe they aren't good at education. Oh, yep, stay on the slide. Sorry. Uh, behaviorism is present in software design because it assumes the brain is like a computer or like a machine. And I would argue that it's really not. So software designers should focus on developing tools that reflect a different set of values, like creativity, empathy, and collaboration. And I, I would also say there are good examples of uh, gamification in software tools that do this. The morning session on Kevin, that uh, Kevin Dixie did, he nailed it. Uh, the presentation on gamification was really good. He talked about the social and collaborative and creative benefits of gamification. <laughs> Behaviorism implies that it's OK for people to be manipulated and controlled and behaviorist technology sometimes hides the people, powers, or ideologies behind that. And we know that when software is used for manipulation, it can cause problems. <laughs> so here are a couple of references that influenced uh, what I just talked about, a couple of really good reads. This is a, a art, short article that talks about more humanistic elements of gamification, and this is a book about the history of education research. Uh, a couple of really good reads. So now that I've totally bashed behaviorism, can I get some MET money? <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Do we have time? Thanks. I have a question. Yes. So in gamification studies, and I wasn't at that session, but one of the, th the list of things that people want from games are status, access, power, and stuff in that order. So okay. net money would be the lowest, I'm just saying. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but my question um, is, how would that feed into behaviorism? Like, what, what, how would you connect those drives to have status, access, power, and stuff to behaviorism? Um, good, really good question. I don't know if I can answer it on the spot, mm -hmm. but I think that if there's a, a structure or some kind of an implementation that there's like somebody behind the curtain that's trying to use that to like move people in certain directions and people don't have 
uh, any agency in that or they don't understand what they're kind of committing to, then that's where it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you think about this, what are the instructional models that you think are promising or what forms of teaching are promising to yeah, respect yeah. the human, not as a, uh, uh, you know, as a rat? <laughs> yeah. I, th I think there's, I mean, all kinds of them, right? And um, there are so many different models and so many different ways to interpret and apply them. I see a lot of promise, because I work in IT, and I see a lot of promise in um, like design-based research because they're, they prioritize empathizing with users and really trying to solve people's problems and, and uh, getting them involved in the design process. So I'm, I'm attracted to things like that from like a software development standpoint. From a pedagogical standpoint, um, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff about communities of inquiry, transformational learning. I think those are kind of in line with non-behaviorist approaches. Um, how does how is it how does behaviorism work in sort of a cultural like setting? Like does it like is it less valid because of the way Americans are? Does behaviorism work better in like a European educational like uh, setting, for uh, instance? Good. I, I don't know. I I think uh, hmm. Is there, are there differences like internationally in how this is applied? I mean, I I'm, I'm from I'm coming from the standpoint that it, it we should try to move away from it, but I also think that it's really really like entrenched in how we think of education and study it and apply it because of the kind of dominant research agenda from a hundred years ago that's just kind of taken on a life of its own and had a snowball effect. That's not really what you were asking, though. Uh, I know it just seems like because like Europeans seem to be heavily vested in sort of this rote mastery form of education, but I could be wrong, yeah, like, I, yeah. I might not really understand. Yes and no, I mean, I think, I think some, in some countries, I see a lot of Scandinavian countries where it's, the focus is more on, like, bringing up the new generation and promoting, like, uh, self-autonomy and stuff, and so it depends on, depends on what country you're in, I guess, but. Leif, if yeah. I, as, as a former kind of skilled European in the room, yeah, uh, yeah, you would know. I, I would say that the, the strength of, I mean, although there are some British tech companies who will be all about behaviorism, uh, I would say the strength and the, the dominance of that way of thinking, is I've seen it much more in the past six years in the US than I ever saw in US high, in UK higher ed. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of measure everything is, and if, yeah, I, I've seen that as more as a trend in the US. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone.